All right, everybody, uh, we're going to uh, get started tonight. And as we get started, uh, listen, uh, just a few words about Justice and Beyond. Justice and Beyond has been organizing for nearly a decade and uh, fighting on many issues. Uh, and in this uh, iteration of Justice and Beyond, I, I want you to know that we are led by what we call pillars. Uh, these are individuals or organizations uh, that have dedicated themselves to um, making sure that uh, we manage as pillars justice and beyond, that we cast the vision of what we want to do, issues that we want to tackle, tackle, that we listen to the community and different organizations and say, uh, we need to get people on board with this. So that's what we do. These pillars uh, are in regular attendance at our pillar meetings. Uh, those happen on Tuesdays when we come together uh, to figure out what we're going to do next. Uh, and so we, uh, it, it, I want to make it clear that we need other pillar uh, individuals and other pillar groups. That means individuals that are representing groups to join us. If you have that time on Tuesday at noon, please come and join us and be a part of that uh, uh, organizing and, and that meeting uh, to cast the vision for Justice and Beyond and to plan with us uh, what the future of Justice and Beyond looks like. We need your help. Um, and so uh, with that said, um, know that we're doing some important work when it comes to uh, education in our city uh, and the charter school system. Uh, we want to continue to to keep people uh, in, in mind and uh, understand what changes we can make there. And we're excited about what's going on as we, we continue that fight and many others. So stay tuned and please, please, uh, we need your help. So with that said, um, and know that there are other people in the background who are doing some things. You may see me up front, but there's people that are making sure that people are let into the room. People take uh, 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 comments and, 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 and mark those as we have our conversation so that we can answer questions uh, and people handling just technical stuff too as well too. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat. If you're not getting our newsletter, write that in the chat, communicate that with Brooke Randolph and you'll find her name uh, and, uh, in the uh, participant list. Let her know uh, that you're not getting the newsletter. We'll make sure that you get that. With no further ado, I want to introduce to you um, two uh, incredible women that I am so blessed and so honored to have the privilege of knowing and 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 uh, really standing alongside in many ways and just seeing their courage uh, and their outspokenness uh, in the face of much confrontation uh, it has been just uh, a source of just uh, uh, being an example to me and encouragement to myself. So thank you both, Joy and Joe Banner. We are so glad to have you here tonight. And uh, uh, just uh, just say a few words about yourself, and then you really just have the floor. And I, I may, you know, jump in and ask a question every now and then, but we're going to go till six and when uh, everyone else has questions. So the floor is yours, Joe and Joy. Give us an introduction first and then tell us what we need to know, please. Yeah, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Pastor Manning. Um, and, and thank you, first of all, to all of you that have been following our, our efforts and our challenges here in St. John Parish. Some of you have you know, come to our, our meetings and have been there in the room with us to support us. And others of you have shared our information, even when you couldn't be there physically with us. And I just want to let you know that all of those efforts on your part mean so much to us in our fight, and especially in keeping our spirits uplifted. Um, so with that being said, my name is Joy Banner. I'm the direct co-director and co-founder of the Descendants Project. We're based in St. John the Baptist Parish in a little town, rather a village. Um, 45 miles west of, of New Orleans, well, actually in the middle of New Orleans in Baton Rouge. And I'll pass it along to Joe for her to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Apologies. I'm driving. Um, I'm in my car right now. Um, driving home from New Orleans. There was two wrecks, one on IT and one on VET. So I'm about, about an hour behind. But um, yeah, I'm I'm Joe. I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of the Descendants Project with Joy. And as, as she said, it's good to be on the phone call with you all tonight. We've really felt the love and support of everyone. Um, you all, we've talked about our history and how precious it is to us being from an area 
um, for over 300 years. And we really tried our best to celebrate that and make sure we protect that. And we've seen many of your faces in that fight with us in those celebrations with us. So with that being said, I'll let Joy go ahead and start the presentation. Yes, so thank you. And I think, and I may need the, I think I can share the screen. If you can let me share the screen, Pastor Manning. Okay, I think uh, Kiana may get that. Kiana, can you handle that? Yes, I just made you co-host. You can ignore okay. the acceptance awesome. of the participants in the corner when they pop up. <laughs> okay, so I think everyone can see my screen. Okay, so uh, again, we're Joe and Joy Banner. We're from the Descendants Project. And I have this presentation, one of the areas that I'm going to focus on in particular is with our battle and with our fight, not go through it, what we've really relied very heavily on is um, historic and heritage preservation. So that's an area that a lot of people say to us that they don't know a lot about and they, they want more information. So I, I, I framed it from there, but as you'll see from my presentation, it intersects quite a bit of few things. Included, including injustice and especially environmental racism, environmental issues. I just want to point out too that I, I very rarely, I forget to do this with the Descendants Project and our logo. Does anyone know what that top logo, the top portion of our logo is a little X looking symbol? So it's an Adinkra symbol. I think most people are mostly associated with like Sankofa, um, so it's one of those West African uh, symbols, but this one is Fawudie, and its meaning means liberation, but the full phrase, and I do not know how to pronounce the full phrase, I need to learn how to, but the full meaning of it is emancip emancipation or liberation comes with responsibility. So I think um, with the Descendants Project, we are about liberation, we are about you know, fighting those systems of injustice, but we also uh, are, we make our, we remind ourselves that what we do comes with that responsibility. And we all have an obligation and responsibility to keep ourselves liberated. So uh, as we get into the presentation, uh, as before I begin, I like to, many of you are pretty familiar with this map, but I always like to start off here just to show people the extent of the plantations that existed in Louisiana and this map is from 1858, is Norman's chart, is or referred to as the Persac map. We would appear, um, I, I flipped the flipped this around so you could fit it, so I could fit it in the screen. But here's St. John the Baptist Parish. So each one of those slivers represent a plantation. All right. So these are all sugar, rice, and when you get beyond the beyond Baton Rouge. It, it turns into, I think, rice and, and cotton. Cotton can grow very well down here. Um, so it's mostly sugarcane. And so you can see that there are hundreds of plantations that line the Mississippi River historically. So who we are as a Descendants Project, we are in face of, of what we need. So when we say the Descendants Project, um, we are descended from the people that were enslaved at one or more of those plantations, including Whitney, Laura, Evergreen, and probably several other that we'll never, never really be able to trace our lineage back to. But we are committed to healing and flourishing of the Black descended community, but not exclusive to this, the Black descended community. And we embrace and our culture, but at the same time, we understand the histories of enslavement, um, settler colonialism and environmental degradation. And those are the things that we um, attempt to liberate ourselves, work to liberate ourselves from. And hey, another map- on Zoom. Can you pick me up tomorrow? Okay. Uh, um, the, okay. uh, is, is someone please mute your phone. Thank you, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, someone needs a ride, I understand. You gotta get your ride straight. <laughs> uh, but we have the plantation map and this is something that I'd like to show because it's very decorative, it's very pretty, it's very neat. It makes you just want to go to and, and enjoy yourself at any of these little mansions, right? And I like how this one at Frogmore even has a tiny little drawing of a, a majestic fountain for you to enjoy, you know, as you co come and visit this plantation. So it's very, 
very grand, it's very glorious and, and pretty. So that's the idea when we talk about Louisiana plantations and the way that plantations are marketed, this is what we are often presented with. Whoops, and I accidentally got myself off of the, sorry about that folks. Um, okay, and I think the reason why I had this slide um, in here, I want to show you from the tourism standpoint, the New Orleans plantation country, um, Louisiana history and culture. This is actually from Visit the USA, Travel USA, the official site. And you can see this is New Orleans, New Orleans plantation country, country holds a collection of the most glorious plantations in Louisiana, each offering a unique gl glimpse Back in time, depending on the site, the antebellum mansions are surrounded by working farms, gardens, and meticulously maintained grounds. Um, so where in there do you see anything about the brutality, about forced labor, about captivity, about the enslavement you know, of, of millions of African Americans? None of that, ironically, appears in the copy that you see on this site. But what we are also facing is the reality of plantation country, what it means for us. So we have uh, the yellow dots that are popping up are the historical, based on the 1858 map that we just saw, are the plantations. The red dots are the plants that have popped up alongside the plantations. And as you can see, there is an almost one-to-one -one ratio of the amount of plants that are a, a ratio of plants to plantations. They're literally in the same footprints. And why? That's because of A, this is the Mississippi River. This is an interstate, you know, a, a commerce interstate. That's the way it's treated for industry. Uh, it, it gets the Mississippi River, goes out into the Atlantic. So it's an important trade route. Uh, but also it is because of the way that land was distributed among plantation owners in a way that the accumulation the brutality, the wealth, the, the extreme amount of wealth meant that fewer amount of people owned more and more land. So thousands of acres of land. So ordinarily when a, a development is trying to find a place to locate, it would be impossible for them to go somewhere and get a thousand plus acres of land because you'd be dealing with maybe up to a thousand people, you know, but because of the plantation, industrialization and of that footprint, now you are dealing with, it might be five people in, in charge of 1,000 acres of land. It might only be one person and you can get a thousand plus acres and then create your development. But what is alongside of these plantations, these yellow dots, what's not shown here and what me and Joe have been working to, uh, to illustrate is you have black descended communities like ours in Wallace. And so now these descendant communities, they're on the fence line of these plantations, which now have become plants. So that means that there is disparity between um, the pollution that Black communities are receiving, not just because of the historical racism of slavery, but because of the vulnerability of, of African-American communities and the disregard, that legacy of disregard for Black health, Black wellness, and Black happiness. So we... In 2021, we are we were faced with what is what is happening along the Mississippi River, and I think all of you are familiar with what's happening, what has happened in the, on the east bank of St. John the Baptist Parish. Um, you've heard about the fight with Dinka. You've heard about the Marathon Fire um, and Dinka and Dupont. That's of course concerned citizens who who are fronting, you know, that fight. You have Marathon that recently caught on fire. You have Formosa that um, Rye St. James is fighting in St. James Parish. You have Atlantic Aluminum, which is directly across from us. It's a, it's a, a aluminum um, plant that is spitting out mercury and, and, and bauxite and all of the things go, that go into that production. Well, with that, all of that being said, there's still about 15 miles of land on the West Bank that has not been inundated, not the where there is no heavy industry that exists. And the community of Wallace sits right in the middle of it. But what you see next to 
in this little pink cafe, which is our people lit cafe and my pet, my um, neighbor's house is the proposed Greenfield Grain Terminal. This terminal, and I want to make sure that I showed you this picture, it is massive, as you can see. Grain terminals, while it may sound more uh, pastoral, more like American farmer-ish, the truth of the truth is that the grain, grain the grain terminals are more explosive, like Joe likes to say, more explosive than gunpowder factories. Just a layer of dust, the same thickness of a sheet of paper, can cause an explosion. And that's when you know when the, what that's when you know what causes the explosion. In many cases, they never find out. And it's more than one explosion that happens. It's multiple explosions. Well, beyond the risk of of explosions. You still have like, this facility will pump out 100. Dangerous particulate matter 2.5. In the graph, you see 50 silos that is, they're so tall, they're, they're taller, that's tall as the Statue of Liberty at 300 feet. And they're so tall, they would literally block out the sun in our neighborhood. We would be in, sh in the shadow until one o'clock in the afternoon, depending on the time of year. So we'd, we'd be in the middle, not on side a plant, outside of a grain terminal, we would be inside of it. So here's a, a, here is a, a, a scale for reference. Right next to the, this is the, um, the structures that go along with the grain terminal. So in addition to the terminal itself, the grain elevator would extend over the levee and into the Mississippi River and a massive dock is being built along with this. So um, we know that we, that plants and, and the facilities might have pollution, but very rarely do we think about the pollution that's coming from the ship. I shouldn't say very rarely with this crew, we think about it. In fact, Vicki Booth um, has shared presentations about the pollution that's coming from these ships, right? So we would have massive amounts of, of, of massive ships that are called um, Supra Panamax. So they're big enough to, to, too big to even fit through the Panama Canal, but they would be in our Mississippi River right in front of our community. So these are just a reference for scale. So you see the Statue of Liberty and you see also Whitney Plantation right next to it. Now Whitney Plantation is is a mansion, is a rare, is a, a large house. So can you imagine what our little houses look like compared to this structure? And then at the bottom, uh, aside of Whitney, you can see a tiny little person that's you. So that's the 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 scale of a a person versus the scale of this grain elevator. So I I wanted to show, and this is getting into we saw the plantations and we talked about the brutality. So before. Uh, and right at the Civil War, there were 330,000 people enslaved at plantations within the river parishes. Um, millions of dollars. In fact, the a, a large percentage, if not the most percentage of millionaires, lived between um, Natchez and here in New Orleans because of the because of the extraction and the brutality that's coming from plantations. But what is there anything positive that, the, that we can take from these plantations being here? Um, and me and Joe are in that strange position of having to argue or having to use these plantations that have extracted so much from us to actually protect our community. So why um, this plantation that you see on the left is Oak Alley Plantation. It's a National Historic Landmark. The plantation on the right is Evergreen Plantation. It's a National Historic Landmark. Not only is a plantation house a historic landmark, but there's also sugarcane fields and wood woodlands um, associated with Evergreen. And the person who submitted the application for the National Historic Landmark included not only the house, but include the grounds, included the entire setting from the swamp all the way up to the house. All of that is under National Historic Landmark protection. And you have Whitney, that's a National Register Historic District, which is not as strong as a designation. A little bit more about what all of the, why all of these statuses are important. I also wanted to show, before we get into it, um, one of my favorite photographs for obvious reasons. This is a photo, um, it's an unknown soldier but he is a black union soldier still in his uniform after the war and his family. 
The reason why I have them represented is what we have found through our history is that our communities, our, our towns, our little neighborhoods were founded by Black men who ran to the, who self-emancipated, went to the Union lines in Baton Rouge in New Orleans, came back, fought for their freedom, and after the war was over, created financial co-ops in communities, came back and created free towns. And so our little, our villages that people have looked at and said, oh, these little small towns, there's nothing in Wallace, there's nothing on the river road. Um, what they don't see, you know, what we have always felt and understood is that we have so much beautiful history that's here, even in the face of so much trauma and stress. Um, but we have not only our wonderful culture of folklore, of family and networks that we still carry, but we have the um, proud, proud designation of being a haven for freed union, not freed union soldiers, but people who freed themselves and fought for the union. And the soldiers, of course, were men, but we, we also know that the women were also part of, are part of the self-emancipation, even if it was for their husbands, even if there were resistance that they were um, engaging in on these plantations and around these plantations throughout, but they are contributing just as equally to the formations of these free towns. Um, so just to give you, and I, I will try to keep this as brief as possible, but I did want you to understand when we talk about national, uh, when we talk about historic preservation, what that means. So if you talk to me and Joe, you've often heard us say section 106, that we're currently in a section 106 process with the Corps of Engineers. What that specifically refers to is the National Historic Preservation Act of 1960 something, I can't see on my on my screen. Um, but what it does is it requires that each federal agency identify and ass assess the effects and actions of its actions may have on historic buildings. And under Section 106, each federal agency must consider public views and concerns about historic preservations when making final project decisions. So any project that requires federal money, money federal assistance or federal permitting, which in Louisiana, that's a lot because we have a lot of water around us and we have um, government money that's being always, that being quite asked for quite a bit. If the federal government is involved as they often are in these large projects, then section 106 must be taken into consideration. If there is belief that there is known historic preservation or known historic and cultural assets that could be damaged, it will initiate a section 106 review. So that's what we are in the process of. It is between the federal government, your historic preservation officer. So every state have a historic preservation office. office. Um, ours is Louisiana Trust for Louisiana Historic, Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office. So we'll call it El Shippo. And any tribes automatically have a have the ability to be involved in these in these negotiations or in these uh, meetings. And the Advisory Council Historic Preservation, which is a body that, that counsels the president and, and Congress, they are the ones that make the preservation laws. They don't regulate, but I feel like their advisory role, like their powers are so much so that it's very difficult to go through with the project if you don't have the approval of ACHP. Or, but the, the biggest, the best part about it is that any members of the general public with an economic or uh, social cultural interest in the project. So under this law, the Descendants Project, with the advice of our attorney, Pam Spees, and also um, with other plantation, with other people in the historic uh, arena, we were advised to apply for consulting status. And so Joe was the one who wrote the letter early on, wrote it to the to the Admiral of the Corps of Engineers, and we were given consultancy status. And there were some weird things that happened in between there, and I, I'll, I'll go over that at a later time, but it, that wasn't just a seamless process. Some really funny things happened, and we only got that status, only, we only got alerted of the fact that we were given consultant status after we were in the, the, at the United Nations in um, Geneva, Switzerland, and we were in that moment in a meeting with the State Department and arguing that they needed to do a better job of stepping in and protecting the not only our communities, but the burial grounds 
I forgot to mention the burial grounds. Um, they would also be impacted by these by by the green by, by the greenfield development. And that day, that's when we received notification, a letter that we um, were given consulting status. Um, so the things that what Joe, the I, can, um, I don't. Uh, Joe, I could just yeah, interrupt for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Joe. I just wanted to say about these laws that. It's my belief that they were not created to save black sites. The reason these laws came into existence with the National Historic Preservation Act was to protect the monuments that we're used to seeing um, around the country and the sacred sites that other people that um, that white people saw as being sacred, but not necessarily meant for sites like ours. So I think what's what's happening and what's emerging is that this law is really as as communities like ours, as black communities understand their own history and beginning to represent their history, now we really are getting more involved in this process and we're advocating for the recognition of our of our sites. So it's not just the plant the plantation home that gives that recognition, but it's also the cabins for the enslaved. It's also the maybe the chicken coop that they used and all of these different elements that were part of life that would go unrecognized are now getting that that full attention. So these uh, these laws in many ways, I think, are even as although they've been here since 1966, to me, they're like just got a, a fresh paint of coat. They're I mean, yeah, they they put fresh coat of paint, excuse me, because we're able communities like ours, black indigenous communities are seeing the value of these laws and now putting it to the sites that are representative of everybody's culture. Yeah, and that's a, a good point to to make that the, the this process is not perfect by any means. And even in the, the criteria that's used to evaluate these histor the call histor historic and cultural resources, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I, I will say that all of us at the table that's part of the Section 106 process, I think we have elevated and, up, and uplifted many ways in which those laws need to adapt to consider everyone. And another, another not so uh, positive aspect about this process is the, the point is to mitigate. So it's the finding of adverse effects and then what can companies do, what should they do in order to mitigate, right? It's not something that means that a project will not move forward. So if it if you have um, if you have an issue and say okay I found out that this is going to belong in a national register then that means that nobody can come and and build here that's not the case so the idea is to reach an understanding and you see in this last bullet a, a memorandum of agreement to come to how can how can a project mitigate how can a project a, a project be adapted to protect these historic resources. So it's not it's not perfect by any means, but I still think that we um, I just still think that it is a very strong um, tool to have and to be knowledgeable of. Okay, and, and just um very quickly, I, I said all I said these the um, who automatically has consulting party status and your um, applicants, so the applicant itself, so the people that are, are applying to companies applying for the permits or the licenses your Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office, the Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which I just told you about. Now, I wanted to um, uplift and amplify because the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, they don't always get involved. They don't always sit in with a Section 106 process. They have sat in on ours. The National Trust for Historic Preservation doesn't always sit in for, historic, for a Section 106. They're sitting in for hours. Louisiana Trust, they're in our meetings. Louisiana State, they're in our meetings. You know who's not in our meetings? You see where it says here, local government? Nobody from St. John the Baptist Parish is sitting in those meetings. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, which that may be for the best, but they have not. St. John the Baptist Parish, who I think you all know are very much in favor of this Greenfield project for many, many um, suspicious, curious reasons, have not supported us in any way. Our tourist commission, our regional tourist commission, whose job is to protect tourism and historic sites have not said a word. Um, so we are literally on our own other than the wonderful people that are on this call with us now and then our advocates that you see on this list. 
Um, so, so here is just what we talk about the advisory council, and I'm not going to read all of this, but I want to pay attention to what, like what Joe was saying, uh, our recognizing aspects and attributes of our, of black historic preservation or historic preservation and resources of other minority groups and ethnic groups that don't traditionally get represented. So what the advisory council, and again, they advise the president and they advise Congress. So what they said is specifically about Wallace, the significance of an historic district located in or, comp or encompassing the community of Wallace would be inextricably linked to the community's living, ongoing experience of the district and their sense of place in the larger landscape through activities at church, family gatherings, community celebrations of holidays, and day-to-day -day interactions among community members whose families have been in community for generations. Regardless of the eligibility, and this is a, a really important part here, regardless of the eligibility of the individual structures that might be contributing elements of such a district, the community of Wallace as the home place of this descended community might be individual, individually eligible for inclusion on a national register and might be considered a contributing element to a larger historic district or landscape. So they're saying the community, the community as the living community could be a larger historic district. And, if it, and it goes on to say that if the descendants of the formerly enslaved founders of this community stand to be the most impacted by the proposed undertaking, the issues frequently of concern under considerations of environmental justice con converge with the federal agency's responsibility to take into account effects on historic properties of this descendant community might be individually eligible or inclusion on the National Register and might be considered a contributed element. Um, so just to compress that, what this letter did, and I, I want to make sure that I, I share this with you because I think it's a letter that people should use as precedents when they need to, but what is saying, the advisory council is saying that you can't just say we're here, it's just a historic building, um, you got a community of people, but we're here only for historic preservation of structures, so that's irrelevant. What the ACHP did said what they said was a living community falls under historic protection. If you are an environmental justice, which I was told that this is the first time that environmental justice actually has been explored in the context of section 106. Um, first time. So what we have all done and what the ACHP has done is said that you can't just, it's not just about the historic structures, it's about your living community and it's about environmental justice concerns in the heart of Cancer Alley. So that was pretty um, significant. Uh, we were very happy to have this letter. In fact, I, I cried when I read it. It was so um, touching and, and so unexpected that someone would actually really understand um, our communities. So uh, so why, how do how do, the, how does the grain elevator, how does it get so much support? What's going on? Sure. Um, I'm going to go on. Maybe we should ask yeah. if anybody has any questions. Sure. Anybody? Do, uh, so does anyone have any questions at this point? I'm sorry, I was trying to get through and then ask questions, but I should have said that y'all are free to ask me questions at any time. Let's see if we see any questions that anyone has posted thus far in the chat. And then uh, any questions uh, allowed, and then we'll we'll break again for questions at at, at about uh, 10, 10 to fifteen minutes or so at six o'clock. Any questions, anybody? Yeah, we're almost through. There's there, there are none in the chat. Comments, right. nice comments, but no no um. Okay, well, why don't we proceed okay. then? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so what? Economic development and jobs, and, I, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll get through these quickly. Uh, we, one of the things that we are, are suing for is ec this idea of economic development and jobs. So not only are we being promised jobs in, in exchange for sacrificing our communities, um, A, we're not getting those jobs, and B, the economic development that's supposed to be spurred by these, uh, by these developments actually ends up costing us money. So Greenfield has alleged that it will give 200, uh, at least 100 jobs. Uh, if 
they're getting a tax break of $200 million, then that means that we as a community are paying $2 million per job. So that job doesn't seem, you know, that this doesn't seem so much of an economic benefit when we're paying so much in taxes. This, this, would, this would mean that money would be taken from, um, from our ad valerum taxes and school systems and infrastructure, which they would be using for this massive operation. They wouldn't have to pay anything for it. We also found out a couple of weeks ago through a public records request that Greenfield had a conversation with the parish to sell 30 um, to our ship every single day, every single day of the year. And those are the exact same exact words. So all of the water issues that we've been having, especially in St. John the Baptist Parish, we're always under boil water advisories. They had a deal to, to sell 30,000 gallons of our water to ships. Moving on, um, here is a, a, a article that many of you may have seen. It was Gianna um, and Kim Terrell of the Tulane Environmental Law Clinic who uh, did the study that found that oil and, ja oil and gas promises are not usually representative of the local people of color. And so it, it, it employment disparities along Cancer Alley exists. And guess who has the, the greatest disparity? St. John the Baptist Parish. So with that, I wanna move into some successes that we've had. Um, so we've had the National Trust for Historic Preservation listed us as one of the 11 most endangered places in America for 2023. And I know you're saying, well, why, why is that a good thing? But it, it uh, nationally, um, it elevated our fight. And we got almost 15,000 signatures across the world, really, in support of, of our community of Wallace. The West Bank of St. John the Baptist Parish um, is in the pipeline. And that is a wrong word to use in this crowd. My apologies. But it's in the, a pi pipeline for consideration as its own national historic landmark. So again, the greatest extent of protection that you can get for a site, we are about to have that. Um, we are in the pipeline to get about 11 miles, 11 to 15 miles considered a National Historic Landmark. Um, the Corps of Engineers found potential adverse impacts for Evergreen Plantation, Whitney Plantation, Oak Alley Plantation, and Historic Black Cemetery of Willow Grove. Again, you're probably thinking, why is that a good thing um, to find adverse impacts? for not only Evergreen and Whitney, but for Oak Alley Plantation that's 15 miles away. Um, so again, it'd be very difficult for a, for a company to come up with a plan that could successfully mitigate that. Um, I was also selected for the national by the National Trust for Historic Preservation Emerging Leader for 2023. Um, and not just trying to pat myself self on the back, because um, Joe is just as much as part of that award, but all of those, all of those awards, all of that amplification helps. It helps so much. And then I appreciate the National Trust um, continuing to partner with us and continuing to support us in so many ways. And lastly, we had a 30-year industrial zoning ordinance nullified. So our the reason why Greenfield was is allowed to uh to to build where it's building is because of the 30-year ordinance that where our residential land was turned to industrial land. The parish president at the time went to jail for taking a bribe for influencing the industrial zoning, went to jail, however, that zoning stayed on the books. And so that is the reason why Greenfield was able to target us yet again. And so when Joe and I, when we're thinking of a legal strategy, me and Joe did not stop until our lawyers, and, and, they, and our lawyers are wonderful, but we were like, the zoning, please look at the zoning, please look at the zoning from 30 years ago. And they did, and we got that zoning overturned. So now we're next to 1,600 acres of the most beautiful residential land that, you, that you've that ever seen. Um, but that does not mean that we are free and clear, because remember, we said that our, our parish was not, and uh, not our friends, they have been actively campaigning to have this land turned back to industrial zoning. And they've used that. So instead of Greenfield, which Greenfield has the right to apply, reapply for industrial zoning, Greenfield is not doing it. I don't know why. I think they under I think they see things that they don't like. I think they are afraid of what trouble they could get into. 
Um, so they're not touching it. However, the parish council, there was a resolution put on our council agenda to start that process of rezoning it back to industrial. Me and Joe have had to, we've gotten temporary restraining orders and we were successful in getting some of the measures pulled off of the agenda. Um, but the most egregious is the parish president signed off on documentation where her mother-in-law's land as part of this rezoning would also get upzoned back to industrial land. So there's a financial relationship there, the financial benefit to a, a family member that she did not disclose. I filed an ethics complaint. She was investigated by the Board of Ethics. And then she put a resolution on the books to make us as the as the taxpayers, as the residents, to pay for her private attorney that she that she used to defend her against the Board of Ethics. Um, so then that just goes to show you that it's, it's just never over with these people. Um, and here's a slide of just some historical elements that we found in St. John the Baptist Parish. I'm sorry, my slide's a little bit out of order, um, but we have uh, Henry Dema, who was a famous um, Black Union soldier, officer in the Union, um, was a representative, I think the last Black representative in Louisiana at the end of construction. So he's basically ran out of town um, out of a threat of he would be murdered. Uh, so here is pictures on the left-hand side of a protest that happened in St. John, the St. John the Baptist Parish in Edgar. And as you can see, people are protesting on the levee. That's historically significant. And then this is David Bowie. Um, he was actually on his album. He featured a woman known as the Turtle Lady who lived in Edgar, Louisiana. She's a very famous um, circus performer, very famous, very wealthy. So she was here in the here at Edgard. And then lastly, we have Papa Dookie and the Mud People. They might have some people on this call that may have remembered him. But in Wallace, we actually had a um a, a little Woodstock. So Papa Dookie is a is a descendant of, of Union soldiers, grew up right down the street from me. The musical, just famous for his music, world renowned, started a lot of music festivals, but what he's most known for in this part is having um his mud people which were a group of hippies that came and stayed behind the levee in Wallace, right where the Wallace Bridge is, a Veterans Memorial Bridge, stayed there for a few months. So I think that's really cool. And that's part of our history. Joy, Demai, you forgot to mention, it's also one of the founders of Southern University. Tulane, thank you to our, um, our legal team, Center for Constitutional Rights, Tulane Environmental Law Clinic, William Most, and then also we'll have um, Earth Justice representing us on some new cases coming up. So with that, thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen. That, that is absolutely a tremendous and a, a wealth of information to catch us up. And for those who did not know, um, um, you presented that extremely well, um, uh, both of you. Thank you for that. Um, first, before we go to questions, we, we just always want to let people know how they can get involved how they can support you and 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 stand with uh, the Sydney's project. What can we do to help? Yeah, well, if you follow us on our on social media, we're on the Descendants Project uh, on Facebook and on Instagram, and we are Project underscore Descend on Twitter or Twitter X or whatever it is now. And our website is the um, the Descendants Project org. But really following us on social media is a, a is the best way to stay up to date on actions that we have coming up, on meetings um, that we have. And then we, we do Facebook Lives. And so you could all like, get up to date on that information. Thank you, though. And does it help uh, if we are able to, to show up for those uh, wonderful uh, St. John uh, Council meetings? It's so helpful for you all to show up, but I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty for, for asking you to do so because wow. Um, how, however, I will say you will be, oh, you will be uh, entertained, yeah, alarmed, shocked. So it yeah. will be an exciting evening, put it that way. <laughs> Just bring your wine and strong grape juice. Uh <laughs> 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 I I have had the the privilege of uh, we won't call it a privilege, but uh, I've been present at those meetings several times, and you all 
uh, are not overstating uh, how dramatic and and uh, absurd uh, they are, really. Uh, so, but but it is uh, quite something. But it it is helpful for us to show up and to stand in solidarity with the Descendants Project, and and so that they know that there are others uh, who are listening, who are paying attention. Uh, to the issues of in environmental injustice and racism that are going on. Uh, so yes, let's do that. Let me take any questions from those who are participating on the call uh, now. Thank you, Joe and Joy, uh, very much. Let me, let me take questions. Just chime in, anybody, if you have a question. Brooke, if you see any hands that are raised, I don't know, Valerie. Bethany, I think, has a question. Go ahead, Bethany. So my question is, is there a way that we can help get local public health and national public health to support and facilitate saving lives in your community? Yeah, or I could. Oh, Joe, are you going? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, one of the things that um we are trying to raise awareness for um in our in our communities is that the Descendants Project is also also um a recognized uh group for the United Nations Environmental Program and recognized accredited NGO. And as part of that process, uh, we have been engaged in participating in the plastics treaty, the Plastics Pollution Treaty, that is currently in this, I think we're now going into our fourth negotiating convening. So we're there as a frontline community, really trying to advocate for how, what plastic does and plastic pollution does, the upstream production of plastic. We really, as a, as a whole, what we're finding is that a lot of people are not engaged in what's happening in this very important process to create something that would really protect us a lot of communities like St. John Parish, like Wallace. So we want to amplify that that um that treaty as much as possible. Talk about it in your circles, spread the word about it. We we'll, we also make statements. Hopefully, we can intervene on the floor, but sometimes we can't. We can just submit a statement, and but that's something that you can share. So for me, it would be really getting the world to pay attention to the treaty, the impact of plastic. We're trying to really reduce plastic production and reduction by la by large companies, by the Coca-Colas of the world, by the Walmarts, by all these big players who are producing this stuff at an obscene level that's really impacting the health of our our communities in Cancer Rally. Mm -hmm. To add to that too, you know, and people just really need to be aware of the fact that there has been a, a scheme that's been put in place for an intentional plastic build out that is uh, going to keep us addicted to plastics as we are, are trying to at least keep us addicted to plastics. And we have to always also realize what is that uh, statistic that says that we, I think it, we, we consume almost a credit card size amount of plastic. Is it every hour, every day? It's, it's something just a week, just a week my, that that's just mind blowing to me that we can, uh, we consume in our bodies a credit card size amount of plastic uh, per week, and and we've got to pay attention uh, to those adverse uh, um, effects that that amount of plastic has on our bodies. Well, and then I, and I see another hand up, but just very quickly, I want to you know uplift uh, those that, that have been all the work that's been done for the LNG. You know that there was a decision. Um, by Biden to put a pause in those permits is not perfect, um, but it shows you that being involved, following people that are in, that are uplifting, that are speaking, like where I think of of, of Rochetta, um, I would think of James Hyatt, who is who both in Lake Charles, and all the advocates, concerned citizens, Rye St. James, um, Cata, Lean, all of Green Army, shout out your name if, if I'm overlooking you, but really listening to these organizations, following them, and when they're giving you um when they're giving you information and they're showing you how to how to participate, those raising your voice, signing a petition, they do make a difference because we are see we saw some change. And I think it's at least it's some I feel somewhat positive about it. How do we clean that up? 
I see a hand up from Belinda. Yeah. And we've yeah. got another message in the chat. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Good evening, um, Joy. Joe, um, you uh, always do such a fantastic job. You know, um, there is a lot of rumbling on the ground because of you guys are movers and shakers out there in St. John the Baptist Parish. We really appreciate you and the great work that you do. Um, this this is a um, very good topic. I just I think that um, you may have answered my question in regards to you know getting more organization to endorse your work, and um, you know do you have a a, um, a link for that or you know how to go and get more organizations to endorse your work. I think the the link would what I would just recommend our signing up for our newsletter on the on the site itself on the descendantsproject.org. And then um, our information is is on there. So the way that it's happened that organizations that have endorsed our work have reached out to us and and either through email or either through social media. And so we've and we figured out the way that they wanted to support that way. So just going to our website or even reaching out to us on social media is the best way to, to get in touch with us. But thank you. That's a, a wonderful question. Thank you so much for the great work that y'all do. Really appreciate thank you. it. There's another question in the, in the chat by Francis Madison. Would you like to ask that yourself, Francis, or would you like me to ask it? Sorry, you can just go ahead and read it. Um. Go ahead, Brooke, read it, please. Does the new administration afford any possibilities to the struggle or any obstacles? So I, here is, here is the sad silver lining. Um, John Bell Edwards for us was not supportive. And as much as I am afraid of Jeff Landry and his, and his administration, I don't think, knock, I, I you can't knock on wood for it. Um, I'm just so let down by, by the previous administration and, and people in, in our elected officials and standing up for, for us. Like I, 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 I kind of see it a continuation of the same thing. Because John Bell Edwards was not, he was not in support of us, would not speak out against this pro Greenfield project. He was in favor of Greenfield, um, even though he did not say so publicly, even though he had been, he had visited Whitney several times and even declared a, a, a Juneteenth proclamation while on site um, at, at Whitney. Um, so yeah, he was not supportive. So I, I don't, I don't know. But that's a, a good question though. All right, any other questions? Um, this is Belinda Parker Brown again. Have you reached out to any of the um, Landry administration or tried to get a meeting? Do you think it's, in, um, I mean, what do you think about getting a meeting with that administration? Um, I, hey, I, the way that I, it, it, I think that um, I plan to meet with him. I, do I expect much? Probably not. But I, hey, I, I can sit down. I'll sit down and 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 tell and tell anybody, you know, what what our challenges are, what the plight is, and also the information that we have. We have our information makes sense, and it doesn't in all in all the ways that you look at this project, whether it's economics, whether it's environment, um, whether it's you know other opportunities and in other industries. None of this makes business sense at all. Um, and so it's just being able, I think I just sitting down with someone uh, and, and just talking to them human to human. I have, I hope human to human. Uh, I, I'm willing, I'm willing. Well, to I can help. I, I'm, I'm saying that, Joy, because I really would like to help facilitate that meeting if possible. You know, you would, um, I just put my contact information in. Okay. I think that it's going to be very vital that we do that, you know, um, as soon as possible. You know, because they're, you know, this is a big year for us and I can help facilitate that. I do have some um, connections in the um, Landry administration 
And let's try to um, see if we can uh, facilitate, help facilitate that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm copying down your information. Okay. All right. So Thank you, you I'm, I'm very busy. So if you either send me uh, matter of fact, I'm going to give you my email or else you can text me at that number, your email. Okay. And then I'll text you my personal email. And so that we can get in touch with each other because there, you know, um, there is a good opportunity that we can do that sooner than later. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Thank I will you. just get in touch That'd with you. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, Brooke, do you see any? I see no others at this point. All right, what is the... This is... No, Benny just... Pardon me, Reverend Manning. Yeah, go ahead, Liz. Hi, thanks a lot. Could you... Sisters, because I've just been to a few events at your spot. You're such a sweet spot out in Wallace. Could you talk a little bit about art and, and um, you know, affecting people's attitudes about these types of things and how you've used you've used art in in your um, in your organization and activism? That's a great question, Liz. Um, I, the art is something that we we want to bring back. I mean, we have it, but we have such a history of strong artists, as Joy put in the presentation. We have musicians, we have muralists, we have writers. One of them, um, we have uh, one of our residents, our um, natives, has a book on the New York Times list several times. She writes romance novels about football and, and different things, and she's gotten attention for that. So we really want to incorporate this as an industry as well. When we talk about industry too much, we just associate it with petrochemical, a heavy industry, forgetting that there's other type of industries that have existed for generations and that we're quite good at in the river parishes, if I do say so myself. And food is also an art too. And we often skip over that. So we want to incorporate art. We also are working on a few really big projects that will, will really utilize art coming up this year. And y'all stay tuned for that. But also in grief work, we are I have been through a few days of doing um, a video work for a production that we are doing for the Descendants Project and listening to the stories of people and their experience in heavy industry and petrochemical companies and more. And it, it was traumatizing. And it just made me realize that we have to be, uh, we, we need more therapy, we need more trauma support, and we need art to be a part of that process because there are so many stories so many horrific stories and, and battles that people have had to endure working inside these type of facilities. So I really am looking forward to incorporating more art therapy into our, our work. Thank you so much. And hey, that was an excellent question. Thank you for that answer too. Uh, can y'all tell got us- Penny. We've got Penny and then we have John Coco. All right. Yeah, hey everybody, um, thank you. Joe and Dr. Joy for the wonderful presentation. It uh, you had mentioned the St. John the Baptist Parish Council meetings, but uh, my question is, do you do you have other regular meetings that you'd like to bring in, you know, people for? And the reason I mentioned that actually is a little bit of self promotion. I've started an activist calendar, so I'm going to try and uh, post your meetings. And if anyone wants to get on the calendar, you need to send me an email address. Thank you for that reminder, Penny. But so it's for, for us as the Port of South Louisiana, and that's important for residents in St. John, St. James. There's those three parishes. The Tourist Commission, Regional Tourist Commission, there's some, you can find some insights about industry, uh, what's being supported and what's not being supported through them. Um, what else? Economic development meetings and then planning and zoning meetings. And I think those are for all three, all three parishes. It's good to know when those planning and zoning meetings are and when to look out for the agendas. Joy, did you say Port of South Louisiana? Yeah, Port of South Louisiana, yes. So those are meetings, really. 
The regular public meetings that are posted online. Okay, so I'll right. I'll collect those and put it on the calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and that calendar is a great idea. So yeah, send uh any any. I'm I'm sorry. I have construction going on upstairs. I hope that's not disturbing. Um, a, send those to, to Penny if you if you have those. That that keeps us all apprised uh, of what's going on and ways to get involved. Um, better sisters too. Tell us. Oh no, John had a question. Then I'll ask my John, question. Yeah. John. yeah. I um I wanted to uh, to thank you for for doing this tonight and also for all of your work that uh, is is really inspiring to us and uh, I can see the little place in Wallace uh, there's much much more implied all all up and down the river you know uh, uh, we Brooke and I have been working with other people in in New Orleans around the uh, industrial canal that's impacted the Lower Ninth Ward so much. And so much of, of what you've done and uh, really uh, just dovetails with uh, with the things that we're trying to do. And so it's it's been so inspirational to, to hear what you're doing. And uh, and I hope we'll be able to, to work together. Uh, we've benefited from your, uh, what you've been doing. And I think we've been at it over 30 years, but we're, behind uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, we're dealing with the core of engineers on one of its own projects. Mm. So not so uh, interested in uh, standing up for us <laughs> uh, for the historic reasons and for the justice reasons. But, but you know, we know that the traffic that, that comes down with these barges from, from your area comes often through the canal and it had passed us along the river. So so we we really feel uh, together with you guys. And uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. And, and thank Thanks. you for your hard work. And any way that we can be of support, please reach out. All right. Any other questions, Brooke? No, that seems to be it. Right. I was just going to kind of leave on what um, our, our end on what I think is a very good note. Ba uh, Banner Sisters, could you tell us you bought a piece of property to use as your headquarters, I think, uh, on a on a former plantation that was a plantation house. Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. My dog, Louie, was um, <laughs> if he wanted to join the call, too. Um, so, yeah, actually, the, the house that my, so we had it moved from moved from about a mile or two um, upriver from us at, in 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 Wallace, moved to our property, and it was a house that Joe had been admiring since she was a young girl. So she's weird that way that she liked old houses and always wanted that house. And then when it came for sale, um, there, there was a caveat: it was five thousand dollars to buy it, but probably another sixty thousand dollars to move it. <laughs> um, so, we had, so we had it moved. My parents generously gave her the, the money and the support to move a house because she's still pretty young back then. Um, and we moved it to our property. And then we found out that it was um, it's a house from 1806. It's a plantation house. And then um, we are descended from people that inhabited that house. And so it's been there for a while, about 20 years since we've had it in that spot. But um, it's, I think it was just sitting there waiting for its purpose. And so we are using that as the as the headquarters for the Descendants Project. We'll also have some learning labs, genealogy, and also um, a burial ground tr software tracking um, lab that's in there. So and and yeah, and the mini museum. So there's there's lots of plans for it. I I think that is just incredible and ex exciting. So I just wanted you to to share that. Uh, thank you both for the incredible work that y'all doing. If, if if you haven't been uh, for anyone on this call to the FIFO Lay Cafe in Wallace there and uh, taking a, a, a tour and, and been a part of any event that the Descendants Projects are, are, are holding, uh, then make it uh, a point and, and be very intentional about getting engaged by checking out their calendar and seeing what those next upcoming events uh, are. You will not be disappointed. Uh, you will really... Uh, uh, just benefit greatly from being a part of those. So, so again, uh, I encourage that. 
Um, and so let's just remain hopeful and, and know that that the needle is being moved and that there are victories happening. And uh, we got some warriors that we have the privilege of standing alongside in the Banner Sisters. So uh, any closing remarks, Joe and Joy? Uh, just again, just so much, so much appreciation and love for all of all of you. You are the reason why this we can still find joy in this work no pun intended um and we can still have smiles on our faces even when it gets tough so i just really just want to extend my gratitude you're always invited to come and visit visit us out in the wildness and just love you all thank you so much thank you everybody thank you and thank y'all both uh listen everybody um as we prepare to close this meeting we always take an opportunity to have any closing announcements that anybody may have uh, keeping us uh, informed about any events that we uh, should uh, participate in or or in are invited to do so. Do, so does anybody have any announcements at this time? Any I'll go if yes. um, if nobody else wants to go first, I'll go. This is Liz, and um, there's a couple things tomorrow. Um, F no of which a few Justice and Beyond uh, pillar members are members of the Energy Future New Orleans Coalition that meets on Thursday mornings from 10 to 11 that was formed after during the gas plant and after the gas plant fight. Um, so FNO has something going on over the next two or three weeks um educational town halls around energy's gridiron plan that they are promoting very heavily they're asking the city council to approve a billion dollars uh for this storm hardening and resilience so fno's having town halls there is one tomorrow night in the lower nine at the sanchez center and it's from, I believe it's from six to seven and everybody's welcome, refreshments will be served. It's just an hour long. It's for, um, to talk about what these, what this energy plan really means for ratepayers in New Orleans and what are the alternatives. And then at, um, there's another one in Algiers on Thursday night and we'll be putting out, um, be putting out an actions newsletter about it. And then tomorrow in the city council chambers, there's um, utilities uh, committee meetings, one's at 10 a.m. and one's at 1 p.m. They actually are having two meetings instead of one, which means anybody who wants to come in and sit in tomorrow, we need to be in front of the city council to let them know we're paying attention to um, votes. They're going to vote on matching a $50 million grant that Entergy got towards storm hardening. And we're demanding some um, provisions uh, and requirements if the city council wants to vote yes on that $50 million. And once again, so uh, the climate committee is at 10 a.m. And then the other committee is at 1 p.m. And either one or both of those meetings, if people can make, would be fantastic to let the council know that we're really paying attention. All right. Thank you, Liz. Yes, let's show up, make our voices known uh, so that uh, we can uh, let them know that we're paying attention and we, we, we know what needs to happen for the sake of the city of New Orleans. Um, any other announcements? Yes, Pastor. Um, thank yes. you, Pastor Manning. Um, I just put in the chat a link um, where we just had a phenomenal radio show um, with um, Dr. <laughs> Ronald and Stokes out of Atlanta. And we were talking about in this panel about the plight of black and brown doctors and how they are being targeted and under attack and being told that they have to report to prison. Um, um, I really want to be able to have everyone go and listen to this radio show. Um, we also had the administration from um, the Senator there in Atlanta that was listening in that wants to know more about the target on the black and brown doctors here 
especially um, in the United States of America, but it has happened to several of our doctors here in the state of Louisiana that took our interest <laughs> to begin to, um, you know, investigate more on what's happening, you know, with our um, doctors and our communities. Okay, so I would like everybody to listen to that. And I'm looking forward to coming and telling um, Justice and Beyond more about what's happening. All right. Thank you, Sister Belinda. I appreciate that. Yes, we do need to stay informed uh, about what is happening uh, that many people are not aware of. Thank you so much. Any other announcements? Um, not so much an announcement. Thank you all for such an amazing um, bringing this work to the forefront. Joy and Joe, I just found out about you sisters recently. As I said, I'm a daughter of St. John Parish. It is where my family is from. My sister's sitting here with me listening. And when I heard you all would be on today, I had to get on. And I will be connecting with you more about some international work I'm doing with the group that I work with um, globally and then with the Ashe Cultural Arts Center, who is very rooted also in environmental work in this area. But I want to make a side note uh, because we all work from a lens of often what we have identified as racism and all of its faces. I saw a very interesting movie yesterday and not as much of a movie to enjoy, but a movie to enlighten related to a book that was written by a sister back in 2020 mm -hmm. or our uh, cast, mm -hmm. the origins of our discontent. I ask that we all take a look at that because we use the term racism often and it's something that had been on my mind for a very long time. And after I saw the movie and am now about to buy the book, I realized that um, this is a much deeper thing and that racism is a problem, but it is an international problem, brown on brown people, black on black people, white on white people. We all have our own farms and it comes back to a particular system and can be directly looked at in a way that I think we can start a larger conversation that involves the whole world. Mm. Because when we talk about the Black and African-American plight in St. John Parish, we're looking at a dot on a dot in a dot on a speck. Mm. But when we talk about the larger problem of caste around the world and how we fit into that, that's a conversation that I'd like to see us look at. Hmm. Thank well you. said. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Mama Jay. Thank you so much. Um, any other uh, questions and or comments? Uh, I mean, uh, announcements, actually. All right, everybody. Hearing no further announcements, um, we're going to go ahead and, and end in prayer, as is our normal tradition here at Justice and Beyond. Um, as so that we can leave uh, in peace and uplifting one another and being encouraged, knowing that we cannot do this work without the help of Almighty God, uh, reminding us that we are one humanity and not uh, to uh, fall victim to um, uh, how the world wants to separate us. So as we close tonight, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm just so blessed always to hear Mama Jay's uh, voice and, and, and have her on the, on the call. Mama Jay, would you, would you close us in prayer? Yes, sir. I would be honored to. Thank you so much. Father God, it is always a blessing and a privilege to open the veil and sit with you. I thank you, Lord God, for that opening, for the fact that we can come directly on all that is on our hearts. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've said knock. We're knocking, Lord. You know. You hear our problems. You hear our discontent. You hear our efforts to make what you want to be an equitable source of living, love, life, and respect for all human beings. A place that we can sit on the grass, that we can play with our children. A place where all of our children will be educated. All of our medical needs will be cared for and that we will all have enough. Give us this day. I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would come Help us, strengthen us, lead us, guide us, and comfort us as we go through this. 
I thank you for this forum and each and every person that puts forth each and every day their time, their energy, and their resources to bring forth justice. Help us, Lord, I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was such a blessing. Thank you, Mama J. Appreciate that so much. I owe you a call, too. And uh, we'll be doing that. Um, God bless you all. Be good to one another. Be kind and be safe. Um, and uh, we'll see you back here. Uh, I don't, do we have, yeah, we do have Justice Amiya next week, I believe, uh, but we'll not have it the following week due to Mardi Gras, of course. Uh, but again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks again, Banner Sisters. Keep up the good thank work, you. everybody. Let's thank fight on behalf of each other. God bless. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank good you to see girl. you always. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Good night. Call me. call me, Liz. Belinda wants you to call her so I can get on the calendar for the next meeting. You got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.